Thursday, the 11th of June, the people decide. By 10 p.m., Great Britain will have finally made its choice. Already at the BBC's television centre, tension is mounting. On Thursday night, one of this country's most celebrated public figures will be arriving here to establish which way the die has been cast. Will this be the person you'll be backing in your household? The favourite in homes the length and breadth of these islands. Thursday night, BBC Two, 10 o'clock. Vote Carrot, the only alternative. And BBC Two in just over ten minutes is beating retreat on the Horse Guards Parade, the setting for a dazzling display of musical pageantry. Here on BBC One, it's time for the news and election 87 with Martin Lewis and Andrew Harvey. It's 20 to 9. BBC News and election 87 with Martin Lewis and Andrew Harvey. Good evening. The Iranian government has expelled five British diplomats, including Edward Chaplin, who was detained and beaten up by revolutionary guards last week. In the election campaign, the Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, has accused Labour of gross incompetence and plain deceit over their tax plans. But Neil Kinnock hit back, saying no one earning less than £500 a week would be worse off in any way. Dr. Owen for the Alliance said that Labour was unfit to govern and accused them of betraying the poor. President Reagan, who's in Italy for next week's Venice summit, has gone with his wife Nancy to visit the Pope. They spoke about religious and political oppression in Poland. Fulton Mackay, the prison warder in the TV series Porridge, has died. And England are on top in the test match, but playing against the weather too. Iran is expelling five British diplomats as a reprisal for Britain's decision to throw out five Iranians. The diplomats include Edward Chaplin, the man detained and beaten up by revolutionary guards in Iran last week. He was also threatened with prosecution on charges which Britain says were trumped up. Now he's being sent home without being put on trial. This evening, Ahmed Kasimi, the Iranian arrested in Manchester for shoplifting, who's among those being expelled from here, is believed to have left Britain. And the Iranian embassy says all the others will leave before the stipulated time. Two of the British diplomats being expelled are already back in Britain. One was in the group which flew in from Tehran yesterday, and the other is here on leave. Martin Bell reports. The British had expected some retaliation against their diplomats in Tehran, even though they'd specifically warned against it. But there's relief in Whitehall that Mr Chaplin will now be able to leave the country, though the charges against him still have not been dropped. These charges, as you know, and as we've said many times, are totally fabricated, trumped-up charges. I understand that they are being dropped. Uh, that clearly is a, is a positive sign. But there were no charges to drop, in fact, because they were, they were fabricated. And this was one of the very distressing matters in this whole incident, which, of course, is of Iran's making. It's not of our making. Mr. Chaplin and his family, who were present at his abduction, will be out of Iran within a week. The five expelled Iranians will be gone from this country within five days, and there was a report today that Mr. Kasemi had already left. The Foreign Office is studying a report from the British charge in Tehran before deciding whether to retaliate further. When the expulsions become effective, there will be just 11 British diplomats left in Tehran and 19 Iranians in London. At the present rate, both sides could go to zero very easily, but are unlikely to do so, for it's in neither country's interest. Leading Conservatives have launched an all-out attack on Labour's tax policies. They've accused Labour of gross incompetence and plain deceit in trying to hide its commitment to a big increase in taxation. The assault began at a news conference with the Chancellor Nigel Lawson this morning, and it was followed by speeches from Norman Fowler and Lord Whitelaw. They say that Labour's plans to abolish the married man's tax allowance and to remove the upper earnings limit on national insurance contributions will hit millions of people. But the Labour leader, Neil Kinnock, said today that no one who earns under £500 a week will be worse off in any way. He explained that nobody with children is going to be worse off because of the increase we are making in child benefit. And on the married man's tax allowance, Mr Kinnock said yesterday, anyone at risk will receive a compensation that involves no loss at all. 
The Conservative attack began this morning at the news conferences. Brian Curtois reports. Well, we've been doing a number of different things Mr Lawson led the Conservatives' attack on Labour's taxation policy, claiming that Labour's description of it revealed gross incompetence and plain deceit. They had unsuccessfully tried to conceal a massive increase in taxation. Using a chart, Mr Lawson endeavoured to prove that millions would be worse off under Labour. Why hadn't they mentioned in their manifesto abolition of the married man's tax allowance or removal of the insurance contribution's upper earnings limit? These changes would hit millions of ordinary people. Abolition of the married man's tax allowance would take at least £7.64 a week from six million couples. It would hit many pensioners too. And removal of the upper earnings limit would hit all earners above £15,000 a year. Mr Lawson had to admit that his sums didn't include the money that Labour would give families through child benefit, but the Conservatives still hope their combined assault on Labour's taxation policy will dissuade voters from supporting Labour. Norman Fowler said the taxpayer would have to find the extra money for Labour's three and a half billion social security package. His estimate of the cost more than double. First, Labour's tax and benefit plans will mean major losses for millions of people in this country. Second, Labour have sought to conceal both their tax plans and the true cost of their benefit proposals. And the lesson is clear. You cannot trust the Labour Party. You cannot trust a party that hides major policy proposals affecting millions of people to form a government in this country. Tonight, Neil Kinnock hit back, insisting that only the better off would have to pay out more under Labour. There's no one on under £500 a week that's going to be uh, worse off in any way. And for the great majority of people above that, the only incidence is national insurance contributions, which we made very clear all along, or on the very top, the top 5%, uh, an additional tax to get back the £3.6 billion a year that the Conservative government has been given away to the richest people in our society. Well, the attacks from the Conservatives have thrown into sharp focus the Labour Party's tax plans. Their manifesto makes it clear they'll restore the income tax cut in the last budget to create jobs and they'll raise taxes on the top 5% of the population to pay for their poverty programme. But Labour are also planning to make some people pay more in national insurance contributions and to abolish the married man's tax allowance. At present, a married man receives a larger tax allowance than a single person. This means married couples with both earning do best from the tax system. They receive both the married man's allowance and an allowance on the wife's earned income. What Labour propose are allowances which would be the same for all, married or unmarried, and probably at the level of the current single person's allowance. The money saved would be used to increase the caring benefits, particularly child benefit. The increase in child benefit would mean there'd be no overall financial loss for a couple with children. But a couple with no children would be £400 a year worse off, regardless of whether only one or both of them work. Because the change would affect all taxpaying couples, even those on less than average earnings would lose. The Labour Party's proposals would mean that any family with children would be exactly unaffected by the change. The increase in tax from the abolition of the married man's allowance is exactly offset by the increase in child benefit for the first child. But that increase in child benefit won't use all of the money raised from abolishing the married man's allowance. That which is left over might be used to prevent some childless families from losing in the short term, or could be used to increase child benefit for second and subsequent children so that any family with more than one child would actually gain substantially from the change. The other reform being planned by Labour is to abolish the upper limit on national insurance contributions. At the moment, this stands at £15,340 a year. Whatever you earn above this, you don't pay any more in national insurance. But under Labour's plans, you would. For instance, someone earning £17,500 would be about £194 a year worse off. Someone earning £20,000 would pay nearly £420 a year more. And on £25,000, you would lose almost £870 a year. So Labour would be hitting more people than the top 5% of taxpayers they say they intend to penalise. 
But the trouble with abolishing the national insurance ceiling is that it means anybody earning more than £15,000 a year will lose. Now, it's only above something like £27,000 a year that we get into the top 5%. So abolishing the national insurance ceiling will mean losses for everybody above £15,000 a year, not just the top 5% of earners. And is there no way that you can cushion those in the middle income brackets? Well, there might be some complicated ways of cushioning those in the middle income brackets. The trouble is that if those people are compensated, then no money is raised from them. And that still leaves us with the question of where is all of the money for the anti-poverty programme raised from the top 5% going to come from? The Shadow Chancellor, Roy Hattersley, is in our Cambridge studio now. Mr Hattersley, it now seems that six million couples without children will be worse off under Labour's plans to abolish the married man's tax allowance. Why didn't you put that in your manifesto? Because it's not true. Had the figures you just recited being true, the situation you described would be accurate. They're from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Uh, I don't care, Mr Lewis, who they're from. We have no intention of making the tax changes which you thought it right to describe. What we've said, and I repeat, we're going to have independent taxation for married couples, but that is not the same as simply abolishing the married man's allowance. There are ways, and we intend to produce ways, and intend to implement ways, by which everybody is protected to ensure that there are no net losers amongst existing taxpayers. And if the Institute of Fiscal Studies did not build that into their calculation, the little film that's just preceded this interview is wholly worthless. But are you saying that that includes married couples without children as married couples with children? Of no change at all? Of course I am. The tax liability for married couples without children depends on how the allowances, the independent allowances, are calculated. What the Institute have assumed, what Mr Nigel Lawson has assumed, though I expect it from him, is that the allowance will be simply abolished. I repeat that the allowance on independent taxation will be so constructed that no existing taxpayers will lose. Well, can I turn now to your plan to abolish the upper limit on national insurance contributions? That's also an error. Let me explain the error. Well, well can I ask, can I put this question well, to you? Well, would you like to know How the error? An... Yes, please. All right. The error is the assumption that the present percentage of national insurance contribution is simply going to be maintained over £15,000. That isn't our intention. It's never been our intention. Our intention is to introduce a new system of collection, which certainly won't prejudice the interests of people below £25,000, but will make the very rich pay a good deal more than they're paying now. But Brian Gould said only yesterday that it was impossible to guarantee that there would be no one under £500 a week, 25000 a year, who would not be paying a penny more. Of course that's true, but that's fundamentally different from the partial and contentious picture that you thought it right to give. Well, you say that that, is, that that is true, and yet Mr Kinnock today said something rather different, and this is why I think there's some confusion over Labour's policy towards uh, taxation. Mr Kinnock said that he could guarantee categorically that there'd be no one under £500 a week who would, uh, who would be any worse off. But in any exactly way, he said. exactly what I said a moment ago. Yes, and so Mr Gould said he couldn't make that guarantee. But I'm sure it's good entertainment for Saturday night, <laughs> but first you well, try to draw, drive a wedge between me and Mr Gould for saying one thing. Now you try, try to drive a wedge between Mr Kinnock and me for saying what you now agree, I Mr. said. Mr. It's, all, it's all trivial stuff, Mr Lewis, no, you want to be in the entertainment business. It seems that you have agreed with Mr Gould on one hand, while well, Mr Gould is saying something rather different from Mr Kinnock. No, Mr Kinnock has said categorically it's Euclidean today... Demo it's Euclidean geometry. When two sides of a triangle are equal and the third side is equal to the one, then they're all equal to each other. Well, let me put it this way, Mr Hattersley. Can you then go along with Mr Kinnock now and guarantee that no one earning up to £500 a week will be any worse off, and I quote Mr Kinnock, in any way under Labour's tax plans? Not only do I guarantee it categorically to you tonight, I've been guaranteeing it categorically, meeting after meeting, interview after interview. You only read it tonight because Mr Lawson thought it right to tell lies about our proposals at the press conference this morning. I raise it because we are simply trying to clarify some confusion that appears to exist in Labour's taxation plans. Well, I think Mr. perhaps between us we've managed to do that. It's the categorical assurance that nobody under £500 a week, individuals on £500 a week, is going to suffer. They'll suffer, of course, from the increase in VAT that Mr Lawson proposes, They'll suffer, of course, from the poll tax which he proposes, but they won't suffer under the Labour government. Mr Hattersley, thank you very much indeed. Well, now to the opinion polls. There are three of them in tomorrow morning's papers. Here's Peter Snow with the details. With only five days to go until polling day, Conservative support is holding up well, as is confirmed by tonight's poll from Harris in The Observer. It shows the Conservatives on 44%, Labour on 33 and the Alliance on 21 
And that Conservative lead of 11% is confirmed in the first of tonight's two panel polls, where those re-interviewed by Morrie for the Sunday Times put the Conservatives just a bit further ahead than Gallup in the Sunday Telegraph. Compared with last Sunday, that's down one in Morrie and no change in Gallup. Labour are second in both, up by half of 1% on last week according to Gallup, and the Alliance stay third, gaining just 1% of support in Morrie. Now, leaving out those panels in which people were re-interviewed and including only regular polls, this is how the election race in our poll of polls looks this weekend. The Conservatives holding steady to end the week at 42.5%. Labour up from the beginning of the week but ending just down on yesterday at 35 and the Alliance finishing the week as they began on 21. So, Conservative support is actually unchanged from the day Mrs Thatcher called the election in spite of all the ups and downs of the past three and a half weeks. Labour is up three and a half points since it all began, and the Alliance is down three and a half points. An election tonight on the basis of our poll of polls would give the Conservatives 353 seats, Labour 259, the Alliance 17, and the others 21. If you put in the winning post, it would mean the Conservatives would be through it with an overall majority of 56 seats. Now, that would be well under half Mrs Thatcher's majority in the last Parliament. But even if, between now and polling day, it were halved again, she would still have a government well enough placed to run a full term on those figures. Andrew. Well, Mrs Thatcher said today she was passionate about the outcome of the election and appalled at the thought of eight years' work being thrown away. The Prime Minister's Day began earlier at the studio of the BBC's Today programme, where she was met by the presenter, John Humphreys. She was asked about her attitude to the National Health Service. Is that people should be free to spend it. I never jumped the queue. No one could ever accuse me of that. I've been very careful not to. Later, it was the photographer's turn as Mrs Thatcher helped out at the opening of a new service area on the M25 motorway. A visit to the British Aerospace factory in Hertfordshire gave Mr Kinnock and his wife a perfect photo opportunity and gave Mr Kinnock a chance to assure workers that Labour's defence policy would boost demand for their products. He also took aim at the latest polls. The party's own polls, he said, showed that the real gap between them and the Conservatives was probably less than four points. An even more seasoned campaigner, Lord Wilson, has been out canvassing in Kent and he's been singing Mr Kinnock's praises. I've only one regret about him, and that was that I, neither I nor James Callaghan made him a junior minister. <laughs> Lord Wilson said he'd been in touch with Mr Kinnock earlier this week, suggesting the Labour Party should put more emphasis on unemployment. The Liberal leader, David Steele, has tonight criticised the government's decision to go ahead with a sizable B nuclear reactor in spite of the accident at Chernobyl. The leader of the SDP, David Owen, turned his fire on Labour, saying they betrayed the poor. He said they were handcuffed by the trade unions and were unfit to govern. If you want Thatcher out, you vote the Alliance. Yeah! Dr Owen showed today that if you still believe you're five days from breaking the mould of British politics, you ignore the West Country weather and then take on the hecklers direct. There's no way, my friend... There's no way, my friend, that the Labour Party's going to have an overall majority either. The only people, the only people, we're not going to keep Thatcher in anymore, any more than we're going to get you lot in, any more than we'll have you lot in. The fashion for some hecklers in this part of Britain is seemingly to carry a red rose. Dr Owen appeared to relish the heckler's presence, but he was effectively silenced and his meeting sabotaged by the arrival of a Labour Party bus with megaphone. No, that's a, it's half the course. The SDP leader insists his morale remains high. He certainly found encouragement in tonight's opinion polls. And early this evening in Portsmouth, after attacking what he called the I'm all right, Jack, years of the Conservative government, he turned on Labour again. The Labour Party betrayed the poor by making itself unfit for office and unable to win office. That's the reality. Only, only the Alliance now holds out hope. Only the Alliance can now win a share of power. And with that power, we have promised the poor that we stand with them.
Meanwhile, one lesson from Dr. Owen's day, trying to break the mould can be dangerous. Avoiding open-top buses might be good advice for all politicians. After spending a day campaigning in the Scottish borders, an area largely unspoiled by the ravages of industry, the Liberal leader spoke tonight of the bleak future facing Britain's environment. He told a packed school hall in Peeblesha that while it couldn't be denied that some people were financially better off after eight years of Tory government, there was now mounting concern about the decline in the quality of life. 95% of our flower-rich meadows, half of our ancient woodlands, two-thirds of our heaths and moors and half of our wetlands 